Hey everyone, uh, thanks for tuning in to the Critical Breakdown. Wanted to make sure you're you're fully aware. We're on Facebook. We're on uh, we're on the we're, we got our website, the Critical Breakdown. And make sure you're leaving ratings and reviews for us on iTunes or whatever podcatcher you're listening on. That uh, helps us out a lot. It uh it, it's what keeps us going. It's how we know that that we're doing the right doing the right stuff for you. And uh, and 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 we'll read them on the air if they're good, you know, if they're funny. So, so bring your A game, people. Um, we've got a, another good episode coming up here that you're really gonna like about about the movie. And uh, hey, thanks for listening. And here's Max. Welcome to the Critical Breakdown, the podcast where we start at the bottom of Rotten Tomatoes and we work our way to 100% fresh week by week. I'm Max. And I'm Scott. And today we're talking Tombstone, rated 73% on Rotten Tomatoes. Starring Kurt Russell, of course. Kurt Russell and Val Kilmer. Yeah. Last week we talked uh, Batman, Michael Keaton's Batman, and this week we're talking Val Kilmer, but not as Batman. Talking Val Kilmer is... we were close enough to Val that we had to talk about a Val Kilmer. Movie, <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. You don't sleep yeah, on Val Kilmer. That's a weird Plus, t- I feel statement. like this is... <laughs> yeah, you sleep with Val Kilmer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I feel like this is sort of an iconic role from him. Like, you hear about it all the time as Doc mm-hmm. Holliday. Yeah. I'm your Huckleberry. You People know, quote all the... that all the time. And you know what? Nobody... Yeah, and nobody, I'm like, I don't get it now that I've seen it. <laughs> nobody has the gravitas he has when he says it, even though I didn't fully, like, get anything from it. He says it with such no. like moxie and gusto and yeah. all the cool words you can think of. We'll talk Val in a minute, but Max, what have you been watching lately? Ooh, I got a lot of stuff I've been watching. Um, all right, man. Well, it's the Halloween season. It's sure October. Is. Everyone's getting spooky and scary. Um, so I went yeah. down to uh, the Airsley Grand Cinema's retro Halloween show and caught the movie Christine. Ooh, John Carpenter, correct? John Carpenter, based off of Stephen King. Um, yeah. It is a very fun movie. It's not the scariest movie I've ever seen, but man, you're smiling the whole time. Um, and it's <laughs> it's weird for like a Halloween type of horror film to like do that, but uh, it's just fun. Um, there are some good like scares here and there. They're not jump scares, but it's just like some some good yeah. kill shots, basically. But uh, Sure. I mean, it's John Carpenter, so if you love John Carpenter, I... I I'm a John Carpenter fan. Like you'll, you'll yeah. get a lot out of it. Um, if you're not, I think you still can get a lot out of it. Uh, the music's amazing. Uh, you'll notice. Did he do the music in it? Yeah. Him and another guy. Uh, I forgot the other guy's I, name. I know it was just announced that like he's doing the music in the, the newest remake of Halloween. And that was like a big deal. Yeah. I so. think he's working with like Trent Reznor or something on that one. Um, oh, wow. That's pretty cool. But, uh, or Trent Reznor did something with some of his music recently. Uh, anyway, he's yeah. mostly done music recently. Anyway. Um, a lot of composition yeah. stuff. Uh, but if you watch any new horror movie that's trying to emulate the old style of horror, even things like Stranger Things, I mean, John Carpenter's music has a big influence on those. Yeah, those pieces just as much as like uh, Blade Runner's Vangelis had an influence on a lot of this stuff. Um, For sure. Uh, you hear it, and when you go back and watch his old stuff, like you can you can hear it in there. So. Um, it's it's just fun to to see some some retro Halloween movies. Um, yeah, obviously that's local to our our city, uh, Charlotte. But uh, yeah, but if you're here in Charlotte, you should definitely go. They're they're doing they're running movies for the rest of the month. So I, I know The Shining is one of uh, one of the movies coming up. Uh, maybe when this one, I don't I don't know the schedule in front of me, but when this one's posted, The Shining's either in the theater or it's in the next week. I think so. The Shining is the final week. Yeah, I'm that's the one I'm like making sure yeah, I go because like I, I don't love horror, so it's Carrie it's and The tough. Shining, the final week, which uh they do double features. Um mm-hmm. and I think this week is Halloween and maybe uh no, it's not Halloween. I don't remember. But I know uh, The Serpent and the Rainbow is one this week, which is a Wes Craven movie about zombie voodoo. That's a that's a strange oh, one. I haven't seen that in a couple of years. Yeah. But uh but I watched some other uh movies. I watched Sleepy Hollow, the Tim Burton movie. Yeah, you're um, actually not the only person that I know who just randomly mentioned to me. Oh yeah, I watched Sleepy Hollow the other day. <laughs> it's on uh, uh, Netflix. I want to say so that makes sense. But, uh, okay. Yeah. I remember enjoying it when I saw it because I saw it when it came out in theaters, and 
it holds up pretty good. It's a less creepy Johnny Depp. Um, I'm not a big fan of Johnny Depp. We've talked about it both that we're not. Um, yeah, the but, Depp Burton combo. Yeah, is and you know. he doesn't play like a straight on hero in this. Like he's a hero, but he's like a weakling for half of it. Um, I mean, Ichabod Crane is known for being, yeah. you know, not a good hero at any in the traditional story. He's like chased out of town. Um, yeah, and like mm-hmm. loses the whole thing. But uh, this is like a, a spin on it. Um. It's good. I mean, it's it's Tim Burton doing Tim Burton in a good way. It's it's it not holds one up of pretty well. yeah. It holds up pretty good, honestly. Um, yeah. it's a simple enough story. It's fun. Uh, Casper Van Dien was in it. Uh, from oh, Starship Troopers. Yeah, Almost sure. all the old white men from Harry Potter sh- make an appearance in this movie. Um, <laughs> uh, Christopher Walken plays a Hessian in the movie. So he plays what? I'm sorry, a Hessian, somebody from uh the oh. the Hes- Hesse area Hesse area of Germany. Um, I thought he played uh, the Headless Horseman. Same thing, buddy. Hey. The Headless Horseman is a Hessian troop from the Revolutionary War. So, did but, I just uh, spoil it for everyone? No, that's like the intro of the is movie. Is it a twist or no? No. Okay. Okay. It's 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 a big plot point, but they get to it in the first five minutes. So, um, no, it's a it's it's good. Let's learn something today hey max not to cut you off there but i just thought while we're on the walking train uh walking himself used to train around the country as a lion tamer before he was an actor what yeah christopher walken was a lion tamer that's he that's traveled weird. the country doing that. yeah how long did he do that for i don't know well i'm glad he went into acting this is let's learn something today not let's learn everything today <laughs> Let's learn something today. And uh, the last movie I watched <laughs> was a uh, it's a film called Julieta. Julieta. I don't know how you'd say it. I think it's Julieta. Um, it's a Spanish film directed by Pedro Almodovar. Which, okay. if if you haven't seen him, he he's pretty prolific. Um, it is a yeah, lot. What's of- his uh, biggest release? He kind of first broke onto the scene. He's known for his, he does comedy and drama, like black comedies and dramas, uh, international yeah. films, obviously, is what we'd call them. But uh, he kind of broke onto the scene with women on the verge of a nervous breakdown. And uh, okay. he is probably best known for Talk to Her, which is a 2002 film, um, All About My Mother, a 99 film, and Volver, a 2006 film. Uh, okay. Julieta was from, I want to say 2016. It's more recent, but uh, it was really good. It's It's hard to explain fully what it's about, but... It's kind of like a couple of vignettes pieced together about the same character. Um, okay. The the titular character, Julieta, uh, how she met kind of like her husband, um, how she lost her husband, and how she lost contact with her daughter. And uh, okay. it's very character driven. Um, it's very good. It's on uh, like stars or something right now, but uh, okay. really enjoyed it. I mean, we put on super late, and I was just like, we're going to have to read because it's subtitled. Yeah. And honestly, we were like both enthralled the whole time so it worked yeah that's i mean if you're watching it late already and i mean a foreign film is a little more of a commitment to focus i mean yeah. sometimes i'll I'll put on a movie at like 11 at night or something and you know i drift off or i yeah. look at my phone and stuff a foreign film you cannot do that with yeah, so you lose the entire plot so yeah exactly so that's a big enough review what drew you to it out of curiosity you just um, see it on your queue and no it's uh that's one of uh jody's favorite filmmakers so i oh, okay uh, cool I listed off three movies we could watch. Uh, I think the options were The Shallows, this, and something else. And she went with that one. Um, we were this close I'm to watching The Shallows. The Shallows because I'm interested in that one too. So. Yeah, no, uh, we could all check that one out. So, well, yeah, speaking of yeah. you and I your interest, uh, Ooh. What, have, what have you been watching? It's a bringer back, sort of, right? Right. <laughs> uh, so you've been on a big movie kick. I have dove, d- dived. I've dived back into TV. He's a TV boy. Maybe. Yeah. So I, uh, I finally finished uh, Atlanta, mm. which I didn't realize was on Hulu. Um, and when I did, I, I just picked it up again and watched it. When it was first airing, I watched like the first four episodes maybe, but I had to find them through uh, illicit means because, or I allegedly <laughs> had to find them through illicit means because- because I was on uh, cable, I, I didn't. I don't have cable, and then I just kind of fell off when I couldn't keep up with uh, the alleged means that I had to 
watch it with. But now that it's on Hulu, I watched it all in like two days. It's honestly one of the better comedies I've seen in a while, just because whenever a comedy can like transcend being just comedy and really make social commentary and stuff, yeah, it just makes it so much better in my eyes. Like that's why Master of None is so good. Yeah. Because it's it's making like real commentaries about things in New York and, and relationships and stuff. And all that is the same way about I mean, a lot of it is kind of the culture we're in with like uh relations with police and race uh race on race violence and stuff and it's just a really interesting uh really interesting show and it just kind of solidifies for me that child uh donald glover is one of the like most talented people in hollywood right now i mean between this and i mean his music career right after atlanta came out he released uh his new um his new album i believe was called awaken my love and it's been like a totally and it's a totally new direction for his music from like that traditional rap to kind of more of a it's kind of it's kind of funk in my eyes, like funk R&B, uh, but it's just really good. And then, I mean, obviously he was in Spider-Man and he writes and does stand up like he's a real renaissance man. So it's really yeah. cool to see that like him in. I, I mentioned Master of None, but Aziz and Sorry is kind of the same way to me. He does the stand up. He just does acting and then he show runs this amazing comedy. So um, being able to do those different things is really cool. And Atlanta is really good. And I recommend it if you have Hulu. And even if you don't, uh, it'd be worth paying money for. Definitely not a legal means, though. No, no, certainly not. Um, season two of Atlanta apparently is coming back in 2018. Hmm. So I didn't something know they were to a season keep two. On, the, on the radar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a big hit. So yeah, uh, makes sense. I, I want to say he won a bunch of Emmys. I feel like, uh, yeah, he did. It, or Golden Globes, maybe. Maybe, probably, you know, probably both. Let's be real. He just did, at least. So yeah, um, he gave him to him. There you go. And what I say goes. Uh, I also started. I have not finished, but I started the new Netflix show Mind Hunter hmm. from the mind of David Fincher. He's the EP on that one, and he directs like four or five of the episodes in the first season. Uh, I it's... only watched a couple, but may, or maybe I've watched three now. Is it a I pretty short one season? Because it's really good. I don't know. It feels like it could be like one of those like eight episode seasons, yeah. like kind of like how some of the Netflix prestige shows go. Um, but I, I didn't look, so I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, yeah, you don't want to look ahead and see the names and stuff, so I can't. Blame yeah, because and then, or like if you see the thumbnail and it might spoil something. But yeah, it's a really cool show. It's all about. Um, it takes place in the I want to say 60s or 70s. I think early 70s. Um, about this FBI hostage negotiator who kind of transitions into like the psychological side of studying like serial killers and things like that to try and get a better understanding of things because you'll be talking to people in the FBI and they're all like, as long as we save the hostage, like if we kill the guy, like that's a win for us. Yeah. Um, and he's like, well, no, that shouldn't be how we, we need to understand these people. And they're on the forefront of like studying like arrested serial killers and stuff to see their mental traits and, the way they see things and using that as a method of catching serial killers and figuring out what's going on. And it's like very early in that with psychological health and everything. So it was kind it's of the, taboo. Whole, uh, the whole profiling thing. Exactly. Yeah. That's exactly what it is. So it's a really cool show. Um, the acting's good. The, I mean, the episodes I'm watching have been directed by Fincher and it's very clear that they're directed by Fincher because he's got a very distinct style, like with the lighting and he always uses digital and um, uh, Nerdwriter did this cool thing about his cam uh, camera movement yeah. where whenever a character's moving, he's moving the camera as well. So, like, it feels very kinetic like that. Um, and it's just a really well shot and well written show. I'm enjoying it so far. A show like this, sometimes it kind of all comes down to how it ends, how it wraps up. So it's hard to judge the whole season when I've only seen a few episodes. But it's really interesting if you have Netflix and you want something that's, like, a little on the creepy side or... I mean, it's got the period piece aspects of it too, and I know a lot of people really enjoy that. It's a really good show. I'm liking it. He uh he started the politics one, right? Uh, why am I forgetting the name? He yeah, he was the executive producer of House of Cards, but I think he only actually directed like two episodes. And after the first or second season, I don't think he's been involved. Did he direct at all. like the first episode? Yeah, when I say he directed the first, and then maybe the last episode of the first season. Yeah. It's kind of funny. Uh, here's a very tiny here be spoilers. Uh, it's a spoiler for um, the first 
uh, three minutes of House of Cards and a spoiler for the first 10 minutes of Mindhunter. But um, House of Cards didn't get a ton of binge viewership at the start because in the first scene of House of Cards, he kills a dog, like a dog's hit by a car. And then Kevin Spacey like chokes the dog to, or like smothers it or something to kill it. And the, he finishes on record. He's like, oh, yeah, like the opening scene was so graphic. I know a lot of people didn't really jump into it. So then with Mindhunter in the opening scene, someone kills themselves by shooting themselves in the head. And it's like all in frame and stuff. It's like, yeah, you really doubled back. Like, yeah. like yeah. You, you fixed your error there. <laughs> so, so, but you know what? What I bet it is, is people just don't like to see dogs die. No, you know? that's always a tough thing. Um, I remember no. I, I've seen certain horror movies that I actually really enjoyed. But once they kill the dog, I'm, I'm like done. So Really? I, I really I think that's kind of a. That's a little bit of a foreign concept for me because I've only had uh, my darling puppy, Mickey, for, uh, well, gosh, now like nine months. But before that, I've never been one of those guys. Like you always hear people say, like, if I could only save a dog or a person, I'd save the dog every time. And I would always be like, that's kind of bullshit. But now I'm like, if I could save Mickey or like a totally random person, I'd at least be thinking. Yeah, well, (laughs) to be honest, whatever situation Mickey got himself in would be very strange, so... Yeah, 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 they're both hanging off a cliff. <laughs> Plus, like, how could I look down at a pug puppy who would have just 100% worry in his eyes and yeah. not save him? Yeah, for real. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I- I've heard some good buzz around Mine Hunter. Yeah, so. it's good. I mean, it's it's uh, it's a slower pace. It's not like an action show, kind of like the Marvel uh, ones on Netflix. But, yeah, um, it's a thinker. You know, I most think, picture uh, properties are. I think in order to pull off like a a slower paced film. You just need to make sure that your characters kind of drive everything. Cause yeah. if, you, if you're going to go with a slower pace to develop things, I mean, the character, the characters need to be compelling and For they sure. need to really wrap you in because then you'll be invested in that slower movement of, of the property. Yeah. And then plus like when you're taking that time to have a slower paced property, you have to have one, a payoff at the end. I mean, a slow burn that just fizzles out is one of the most disappointing things yeah. possible. And then two, the things you're doing in that slow burn, that build up, still need to be compelling. Mm-hmm. Like maybe they don't deliver right away, but they still need to compel. Yeah, I agree. I'm a little bit talking about this week's movie Tombstone. There we go. That's a bringer back. Uh, that's a, that's a bringer back. Uh, what's the hashtag for this week's episode, Max? Um, I mean, I want to go with pepperoni and sausage. It's a long hashtag, but I respect it. I think the problem we're going to see is I think I don't think everyone knows how to spell pepperoni. What about Huckleberry? Hashtag Huckleberry. Hashtag Huckleberry. Yeah. There you go. Max, what's the plot synopsis for Tombstone? A successful lawman's plans to retire anonymously in Tombstone, Arizona, are disrupted by the kind of outlaws he was famous for eliminating. The bad ones. Yeah, the bad outlaws, not the good outlaws. No. These are the ones he's run into before. They got red bandanas and they call themselves cowboys. That could be the like uh that could be the uh, like what's after the colon of like a famous sheriff's autobiography. <laughs> they got red bandanas and they're, they call and they're themselves not the good ones. Cowboys. So this was directed by uh old Georgie P. Cosmatis. But not originally. Yeah, so it's written by Kevin, is it Jar? Jari? Jer? Jer, Jerry, Kevin Jerry. It's J A R R and then a cool E E at the end. Yeah. Kevin Jerry. Um, And he wrote um, Glory. I think that was his big break. Yeah. Uh, And then this was supposed to be his directorial debut, but uh, as soon as the movie started, I think either the producers or he even acknowledged like he was in over his head. And, um, And so they brought in. Uh, Cosmatis to take over still working on the Kevin Jari Jerry script um, but not uh, not directing anymore so yeah yeah um, he uh, it's kind of interesting how that works when you start a movie and just direct a little bit like you're uncredited if you start directing you know but if you get deep into it it's more of an issue uh, and the W yeah, like, uh, uh, the Directors Guild of America whatever you call them. Um, I forgot the name, but, uh, <laughs> the director's the guild, DGA, they're, maybe? yeah, the DGA, they're very, they're very picky on who gets credit. So yeah. obviously, um, Jerry didn't direct a lot of this movie. 
he got a little bit into it and then and then got replaced. So. Yep. Um, and it it, do, it does get interesting with stuff like um, uh, Star Wars um, Rogue One, which had a did it have a like director change or rewrites? It was the uh, the reshoots. Yeah. So the reshoots were done by what Tony Gilroy. Yeah. But, uh, but since, the, since there wasn't yeah, a lot of them, the yeah, he didn't mm-hmm. get a directing credit. Uh, now with Han Solo, that's going to be interesting yeah. to see who gets the credit. Yeah, so when are they going to determine that? Like, uh... I have a theory that I can't prove in any single way, but I kind of feel like... Uh, I kind of feel like Disney would make him kind of reshoot and refilm everything that they could to get him the Ron credit. Howard. Yeah. But that's just my theory. They can, it from Lord and Miller. They can afford to do it, so that's why I'm thinking that. But we'll see. Do you think they could just kind of like try and flex on the Directors Guild and just to, like if they didn't want to have to reshoot everything? I don't uh, know I mean, because I mean, a huge company. So. They're a huge company, but the Directors Guild is like, I mean, that's a powerhouse there. So for sure, yeah. yeah. Um, we'll see. We'll find out soon. Yeah. I feel like. But. Yeah, I mean, the movie comes out next year, right? Yeah. But uh, back back to the old west, man. Um, yeah, back to the old west. This is uh, we picked it because honestly, it's like a star-studded western. Um, yeah, and, and it's always had a lot of buzz around it. Yeah. Um, I feel like this is pretty late in the western game. I mean, obviously, like the spaghetti western of the fifties, sixties, those were big. You had your Clint Eastwood westerns, and then the like late nineties, early two thousands, and stuff. Westerns kind of died off, and this yeah. was probably one of the last "quote unquote" modern westerns that was really well, good. There was a small uptick around this time um, of westerns and western-ish movies. Uh, you had Young Guns, which is like your your youth movies, mm. uh, like Kiefer Sutherland, um, Lou Diamond mm. Phillips. They were in that. Uh, you had Tombstone, and you had White Earp. Yep. Uh, you had more of your long dramatic films like uh, Dances with Wolves, Last of the Mohicans. Yeah, the last so like the 80s into the 90s had this like kind of big rush of it. Um, yeah. Where my issue with this comes from is recently, and, and we've mentioned it on the show before, I watched Unforgiven, yeah. which is like a superb Western film, but it kind of destroyed the genre at the same time. Um, yeah, it's one of those films that... Um, it it very much acknowledges like where Westerns have come from and where they're at there and the things they stand for and maybe not so much turns them on their head, but it definitely uses that as part of the film. Yeah. I mean, it's a best picture winner. It's a great movie. And, um, and the difference there also is like not a bit of screen times ever wasted in the movie. Like yeah. every moment kind of matters for the story while here it just, it just wanders around. Yeah, here it, it was honestly hard for both of us to keep focused on it because they spend a cool 80 minutes at least in the build up before really the first action piece. Yeah. And there's nothing there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but as we were mentioning before with how you need a payoff to your build up and it needs to stay interesting. About halfway through that, you know, they've kind of established okay, Wyatt Earp was this sheriff in Kansas, I believe, and wherever it was and uh, he's got his family with them. They're in this town. The sheriff's a little soft. Oh, there's this gang. They've established all that, but then they never really turn it in any other direction. And it just, for me, honestly, it totally lost me. Yeah. Like that, the big shootout, there's the one shootout and it's the shootout at OK Corral. It's mm-hmm. kind of a famous moment um, just in general. Yeah. And uh, it's why, why the movie was made for all intents and purposes. Um, that's a, that's a cool scene. It's a good moment. Uh, and then the biggest part is supposed to be after that, the Wyatt Earp kind of goes on this vendetta and he rides with um, Doc Holliday and um, a couple other folks um, to avenge the, his one brother dies, right? Morg. Mm-hmm. And um, his other brother, the one played by uh, Sam Elliott, he doesn't die, but he has to leave. Was he Virgil Earp? Was that his name? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Vir- Virgil. And uh, that moment was just totally a letdown. Yeah. You build up to it and it takes about, whereas the rest of the movie meanders a lot, it takes about three minutes to do the whole thing. And there's this one weird twist where they have Doc Holliday like dying slash dead in bed. And then uh, Wyatt Earp's like, all right, well, I'm going to find the guy who killed my brother. 
And by the time Wyatt Earp gets there, Doc Holliday has somehow already gotten there and killed the guy. So, uh, yeah. which is fine, but it was just like weird. It's um, like, why? Why bother? Yeah. And it's not really all that satisfying. No. Um, because Wyatt Earp has all the motivation to kill. It was Johnny Ringo, right? Johnny, yeah. Or was it? Yeah. Uh, Brocious, yeah. It was Johnny Ringo. You want to see Wyatt Earp get the revenge. Yeah. And then it's Doc Holliday who gets in there and does it. And, and it Doc w- Holliday was kind of a cool character, but yeah. yeah. But they didn't even play it as like a we don't get what we want moment. Um, yeah. Like you can do that where the hero doesn't get the moment, but you have to make it like super impactful. And there's just too much of the movie wasted for that. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's not bad. It's just it's not great to me. And it was just kind of slow. There's cool moments. There's moments where you're like, yeah, that's that, that works. Uh, the performances are good enough. Um, Kurt Russell and uh, Val Kilmer are both, I thought, really good. Um, yeah. There's like we said, it's star studded. You have. Kurt Russell and Val Kilmer. Um, Johnny Ringo was played by Michael Bean. Yep. Um, you have, I think his name was like, what was it? There's Curly Bill. Curly Bill yeah, was Powers Bill Booth. Yep. Uh, then you have Dana Delaney playing an actress. I don't remember her name. Um, she played Josephine, I believe. Josephine. You have Sam yep. Elliott playing Virgil Earp. Yep. Stephen Lang. I Remember his character was named Ike? Ike. Ike. Yep. Uh, you have Bill Paxton playing Morg Earp. You have Jason Priestley playing like Bill, another Bill, like Bill. I think it was the name you just said, actually. Uh, Jason Priestley played Bill Breckenridge. That's, yeah. Okay. So he played a Bill. Another. There's too many Bills yeah. in this movie. Thomas Hayden Church sneaks in there. He's one of the Clantons. I believe Thomas Hayden Church's character is Stephen Lang's Ike's brother. That makes sense. Um. Then you also, right at the end, you have Charleston Heston. It's like um, Henry Hooker basically or something? Basically a cameo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, Henry Hooker was his name, but he's in the movie for all of two minutes. Um, you have uh, Michael Rooker. Yeah. Um, and you also nice have... I see young Mike. Yeah. yeah. You have Billy Zane. He's a cool guy. He's playing yeah. Mr... What was his name? Yeah, what was this character's name? He had, he played a weird character, the like, performer slash actor. Um, Mr. It's, who came to town? It was something weird. I, I think I guessed that his character was going to be French based on the name. Uh, Mr. Fabian. Mr. Fabian. That was it. The actor. He was my kind favorite. Of... Yeah, he wasn't French, but he was just like a. Yeah, I, I don't know. European, maybe. He was kind of in a relationship with Dana Delaney, but they never explicitly said it or showed it. But then she was also kind of talking to another actor. Well, no, like she was talking to both uh, Kurt Russell's Wyatt Earp and then yeah. like the mayor of the town. So she yeah. she was flirting her way through the film, but I don't know. Um, there is also this weird subplot of Jason Priestley's Bill and Mr. Fabian having a lot of chemistry. Um, I did some research on that and apparently... Uh, I didn't even pick up on that. <laughs> yeah, they kept like sitting next to each other and looking at each other. And uh, when Mr. Fabian was killed, Bill reached out his hand and caressed Mr. F- Mr. Fabian's hand. Um, but doing some research, because I was like, is that character supposed to be gay or is it just something they threw in there? Because um, most of these characters are real people. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I looked it up and apparently uh, that character of Bill, uh, Bill Breckenridge was always described as a girl by his friends. Um, that'd be like, you know, this town is empty of women unless you include Bill Breckenridge, stuff like that. And, uh, yeah. but they couldn't tell if it was like, just a mean joke or a reference to maybe his sexuality or gender expression. Um, very unclear, but he never had a chance to say himself any of those thoughts, but he stayed single his whole life. And uh, hmm. I feel like I've read historical accounts before where certain real people just stayed single their whole life because they couldn't actually express, you know, how they felt their actual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, feelings. That might be the case here. I don't know, but it, it was an interesting subplot that, like you said, was kind of lost on you. But yeah, I, didn't pick I picked up, on, up it. on it heavily and was just like kind of c- confused by it because they never explicitly yeah. did anything with it, um, yeah. which is a lot of this movie. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite, very minor roles was Billy Bob Thornton, mm-hmm. who plays just like a guy who plays cards. Yeah, he's like a card shark who they have to chase out of a. Uh, a yeah. bar and then white Earp becomes like protector of the bar. What I liked about it was, and th- he's only in the one scene, 
but like Billy Bob Thornton is like noticeably chubby. Yeah. And I just thought it was really funny because he's a very slender man now. I mean, this must have been early. In, I mean, 93. Yeah. He's old enough that he'd probably been acting quite a bit by this time, but it's such a minor role. Um, it was just really funny. <laughs> it was funny. Like um, he, he gets chased out of the bar. And then at one point he like, he runs up to them with a shotgun is like about to kill him again, but they just like embarrass him and he leaves. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then, uh, one, uh, Oh God. No, you go ahead. Well, I was just going to say one other interesting thing is there is a member of the cast named Wyatt Earp, who is a distant cousin of the actual Wyatt Earp. Hmm. He's the fifth cousin of Wyatt Earp. Oh, that is actually interesting. He plays a very minor uh, role. So I guess, uh, you know, if you want that authenticity, you throw an Earp in there. That's right. Yeah, you throw an Earp in there. So there's another movie that came out around the same time called Wyatt Earp, correct? Yeah, it came out a couple months later, but within the same window. It's kind of one of those double movie thing. We've talked about it before, and we see it happen all the time. Um, two movies with essentially the same subject matter or topic or plot uh, come out side to side. And in this case, and I don't know if it's usually the case with movies like this, but in this case, it's because of production drama or production issues at the very start of the movie. What, uh, what were they? So originally cast as Wyatt Earp before Kurt Russell was Kevin Costner. And Kevin Costner was all, all set to be in the movie. And then he read the script from... Uh, Kevin, did we establish how to pronounce that? I think we just said Jare. Jare, okay. Jare. Uh, he read the script and he didn't like it. He wanted this to be a Wyatt Earp movie focused on the Wyatt Earp character. And this movie obviously sprawls and has a huge ensemble and it kind of focuses on everybody. And so uh, Kevin Costner just left and he's like, well, I'm going to make my own movie then about Wyatt Earp. And then he did. He made an, uh, a movie about Wyatt Earp, about the shootout at OK Corral and everything, called Wyatt Earp. Uh, it was reviewed much. Uh, it was not reviewed as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a certified rotten score, I believe, in the 20s. Uh, it came out a couple months later, and it was not nearly as successful. Uh, Tombstone, at the box office, with its $25 million budget, grossed a domestic $56.5 million. Hmm. Um, there was no uh, worldwide number listed on Box Office Mojo, which makes me think um, it was not released in international markets. Um, so that's, I mean, it's not a huge profit, but it's enough. Um, it opened at $6.5 million uh, on Christmas Eve of 1993. You recognize that date, other than for being Christmas Eve. Uh, it's probably because... Uh, Miss, Mrs. Doubtfire was also in theaters. Did you look at that? Uh, Tombstone was number three its opening weekend, and Mrs. Doubtfire in its fifth week was number two. Hmm. And the winner was week two of The Pelican Brief. I've never actually seen The Pelican Brief. Me neither. Didn't we try and establish what it was about? We said Julia Roberts and something about bird law. Yeah, that sounds right to me. And I don't care enough to look it up, I th which I also think was what I said when we first tried to figure it out with Taylor. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the Kevin Costner thing's super interesting, and it, it's totally in his wheelhouse to do Western, so I get that. But uh, yeah, I think Kurt Russell, while I love Kevin Costner, for me, Kurt Russell's kind of more of a uh, charismatic actor. Um, for I me. don't necessarily agree with that. Yeah. Um, it depends on the role, really. I mean, Kurt Russell's done a lot of cool stuff, but Kevin Costner is more so your traditional, um, your traditional Hollywood actor in my eyes, like her pretty traditional leading man. Yeah. No, I'm not saying he's not traditional. I'm just saying, uh, no. to me, Kurt, Kurt Russell has just more charisma to him, more, uh, no. more for me, more appeal than Kevin Costner, who I actually like a lot. So I'm not, I'm not yeah. dissing Costner. I'm just saying, uh. Sure. I'd, I would be more compelled in most roles if you told me Kurt Russell's playing the role than Kevin Costner. That being said, I mean, you know, I, I always go on about his shitty Robin Hood that I love. And, you know, I really yeah. enjoy Costner performances. So not dissing him, just saying uh, the, Kurt, Kurt mean, Russell's definitely there for me. The, uh, the Kevin Costner role for me is um, um, Field of Dreams. It's my I get that. My go to. 
and I mean, Cal- um, Costner is charismatic. Not saying he's not. I'm just saying yeah. for me, the uh, the Kurt Russell charisma brings me in more. Um, yeah. And I mean, it in this movie they they do use him well. He has a lot of good lines where he just. I, at one point, I turned to you and said, "When you hire Kurt mm-hmm. Russell, you write those kind of lines so that he can say yeah. them." I forgot what it was, but it was great. And then you know you have Val Kilmer delivering good lines too. So my favorite was um, when Wyatt Earp says to. It might have been Billy Bob Thornton's character, someone that he had just roughed up. Like, what are you going to do? Just stand there and bleed? <laughs> that was a good line. Um, yeah. Probably yeah. one of my favorite. Uh, yeah. And I mean, the, if the all movie. these moments were compressed, if they took all this dead air that's in the film and compressed it, like you said, get that first yeah. build up down to like 30, 40 minutes. I mean, you could have had a hell of a, an action packed Western from then on. Yeah. I mean, this movie is. Uh, it's two hours and 20 minutes, I think. Uh, it's a, I mean, that's yeah. a long movie. And um, it doesn't need to be. It, this could have been pared down to 90 minutes, and it, yeah. it would have worked to the film's benefit. Uh, now, sure, if you cut it down, you probably don't benefit from the massive ensemble that the movie has. I mean, yeah, if you're cutting it down, you're probably not putting the Billy Bob Thornton role in there. Yeah. You know, you lose some of those moments. Um, Billy Zane but, Faust scene is probably gone. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Or it's at least much briefer. Yeah. Um, um, there was weird subplots, too, where like, um, so Wyatt Earp is flirting with the actress, with Josephine, but he's married mm-hmm. the whole time. And she's just like, aren't you married? And he's like, that's a little personal. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, then his wife leaves with his brother, Virgil, once their family gets a lot of like a violent acts done upon them but uh so she leaves yeah, I mean, with, like the town is controlled by outlaws now yeah. so i get that no and that makes sense but then he's just kind of like all oh, that's dead to me now and uh yeah. you just never hear from her again but then eventually he does pursue josephine and then the mo- when the yes. movie ends it shows them like riding off to the sunset and a narrator is like they stayed together for 40 years turns out yeah. wyatt Earp's wife died shortly thereafter <laughs> <laughs> what like talk about an afterthought yeah and uh, she was like opium addicted which they barely touched on in the film but they did show it one scene where they yeah. showed it yeah and uh it, it was just weird man i, I didn't they get never that. established the relationship as like bad or yeah. like needing fixing or anything they were just like oh yeah uh wyatt earp's married <laughs> but he's gonna date josephine there was also this really weird scene where right after a morgue erp uh gets shot and dies uh, like he dies while Wyatt's like elbow deep inside of him trying to get a bullet out. Yeah. And so Wyatt runs out into the street, like in the rain. It's kind of a stupid scene, honestly. It is. And then Josephine like walks up to him and was like, are you okay? And he's like, like, like get away from me. Or like, I don't want to talk to anyone. And she like cries and runs away. Yeah. For me, it's like Josephine, you got to know the moment you got to play the, yeah. play the room, you know? Yeah. When your man's out there crying, covered in his brother's blood, you just give him space. <laughs> Yeah, you need a little bit of space. Yeah. Like, don't immediately run out there. Yeah, but, it's not um, about you. So that, like, The romance in this movie is nothing. Like, there's nothing no. compelling about it. No. They honest, Honestly, if you're cutting down 30 or 40 minutes of the movie, cut the Josephine romance. I didn't care. And Or, I mean, just like, cut everything just else and, and actually <laughs> focus on it. But Yeah, but I don't want that movie. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I want just, you know, Val Kilmer walking around being cool. So yeah, what's interesting well, is Val uh, Kilmer was swaggering around the whole time. They almost had Willem Dafoe in that role, Ugh. which I think would have captured the weirdness of Doc Holliday's character in this, but not the not the coolness. No, the that would have made the character. I mean, because it is Doc Holliday is a very weird character. Yeah, um, and Val Kilmer does that well, but there's also a swagger to him that Val Kilmer definitely captures that Willem Dafoe I can't picture yeah. <laughs> pulling off. I'd- Doc Holliday is interesting. The first scene of the movie is him. It it looks like he's robbing like a card game. Mm-hmm. Like they're playing cards and he ends up pulling his guns on someone. And uh, he's like a little drunk. And, and then his wife or girl or whatever is like taking all the money off the table. So I thought it was a robbery. But I think what it turns out to be would, is uh, someone was trying to like stop him from getting his money or run him yeah. out of the, yeah. the town. So he was kind of just standing up for himself. And as you meet Doc Holliday and see him and Wyatt Earp interacting, I thought, especially after that scene, that Doc Holliday was going to be the villain. Like that was going to be the main conflict, but they end up working together. 
And then Doc has, I mean, he has tuberculosis and he's like constantly drunk and he plays the piano. Like there's all these weird traits about him. Um, his LinkedIn profile would be nuts. Yeah. Um, and then I guess this whole time he wanted to be like a sheriff or a deputy because they make like a big point at the end of showing Wyatt Earp give him the sheriff's badge and stuff. It was yeah. like a big moment for his character. But like I never picked up throughout the first half of the movie that that was something he wanted. Yeah, they, they never like really drove that point. So no, it's kind of like, at all. okay, yeah. I guess that's important. And, and if you build that side of the character up, like make him a someone who wants to do good, but for for circumstances and stuff, he, he's never been able to really toe the line like that. Um, then maybe that delivers pretty well, but it's just like, who cares at that yeah. point? He does have all of the coolest moments of the movie. Like, um, he gets to kill the, the bad guy at the very end. Uh, he also has one scene where he's, they're, they're kind of, I don't think there's a shootout at this point, but everyone's like drawing their guns in the street and stuff. And the tension is building and he's like barely on his feet drunk. And someone says to him, like, like, oh, like, uh, you're like, we know Doc's not going to do anything. He's seeing two of me. And then Doc pulls out a second gun. He's like, well, I got one for each of you. And it was just, it was a really cool moment. Yeah. Yeah. I like the, uh, Michael Bean played a bad guy that was kind of disappointing in the end, but in the beginning, yeah. he just seemed knocking futz, man. He looked, he was doing crazy eye. And normally you see Michael Bean as like, kind of like a tough, cool, good guy, like, you know, in Terminator. Yeah. Um, but in this, he's just playing like kind of a, a weirdo. And it, it matched Doc Holliday's weirdness. So I was like, cool, they're going to do like a, a matching of the weirdos. Um, yeah. And in the middle of like a poker night, uh, Wyatt Earp's just like, you know, hosting hosting games at his bar. And then uh, Curly Bill and uh, Ringo walk up and they start talking shit for no actual reason um, other than to talk shit. And well, I think, I think part of it, just before you go on, I think part of it is because... Um, Wyatt Earp is like a celebrity basically at yeah, this point. And yeah. they're like, oh, there's the lawman and stuff. Yeah. But go ahead. So yeah, they go to talk shit at the lawman. Um <laughs> and like Curly Bill is obviously just kind of messing with them, but not in a I'm gonna kill you kind of way. Just like a yeah. hey dude, you suck. I'm cool. This is my town. What up? Kind of like giving a greeting, but also being a jerk. And then yeah. freaking Ringo is like, Oh, you're Doc Holiday, and then like pulls out his gun. Uh, Wyatt Earp has a hidden shotgun under his table just for safety, but uh, yeah. and then Ringo does like a twenty-minute gun twirl, um, that was yeah. cool yeah. and took a lot of practice. And the whole bar's like, oh shit! It's like it's like a uh, the Nick Cannon show where people used to uh, uh, wild and out. Is that where they would insult each other? Yeah, and it's let's not use the past tense because it's back. Oh, I didn't know it's back, but uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's it's kind of like one of those beef type of things. Um, yeah. But yeah, Ringo's just going going hard on his gun twirling, man. Um, he spends a lot of time uh, twirling it around behind his head, like he does, like over the knee, yeah. um, under the leg, like behind he him. Too, too much time. Like it could have, you, if you replaced it with a basketball, it could have been a scene from uh, Space Jam. Yeah. Uh, but uh, he spends, like you said, too much time, and then puts his gun up at the last second, and uh, like he's gonna shoot him, but then puts it in the holster. So Doc Holliday now has to react like he's put on, you know, like he has to react. And so he fakes like he's going to go for his gun. But instead, yeah. he takes the tiny like nickel plated cup that he's drinking out of. That's probably like the size of a shot glass. And he yeah. does all the same movements with his drinking cup. And he's making like funny noises with his mouth. <laughs> he's like, pew, 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 pew. yeah. <laughs> and it's such a weird moment. But honestly, it was really funny and really cool. And the great. The, the best response you could have had to it, um, to some guy trolling yeah. a gun at you. But I wanted more yeah. of that in here. I wanted more of Val Kilmer and yeah. Michael Bean being weirdos to each other. And yeah, honestly, I don't. I wouldn't have minded if the main character of this movie was Doc Holliday. Yeah, same. Like I, I didn't care about any of the depth they brought into Wyatt Earp. Like again, the Josephine relationship. Yeah. But I mean, Wyatt Earp is the bigger character, but uh, Doc Holliday was the the attraction. Yeah, for sure. Without a doubt. Um, one thing that's sort of funny is uh, I'm looking at the cast list and reading like a plot synopsis for Wyatt Earp, the Kevin mm -hmm. Costner one, and Dennis Quaid plays Doc Holliday. And so I'm trying to imagine plugging Dennis Quaid into this Doc Holliday, and it does not work. It does not, no. But what's also interesting is um, the plot is totally different, and 
like uh, uh, Johnny Ringo might not even be in it. Like on the cast list on Wikipedia, he's not listed. So I'm curious as to what the conflict is. I can't tell who the primary villain is. It, but yeah. Tom Sizemore's in this as a character named Bat Masterson, but I don't think he is the villain. So I, I can't figure it out in this. I think that one's more book. a full like life story of Earp. It definitely includes like the Kansas stuff and yeah. everything. So it's not just about the shootout. But what's also a little interesting is when Kevin Costner left Tombstone, um, Wyatt Earp. The movie started ended up with a sixty-three million dollar budget, which is more than double what Tombstone uh, had as a budget. But Wyatt Earp only made twenty-five million. <laughs> so, uh, and apparently, Wyatt uh, Kevin Costner, like after joining this one, he started uh, to like drive distributors away from Tombstone. Um, and all I'm doing, all I'm reading, is from the Wikipedia page, so I can't really vouch for this. But it says Costner proceeded to use his then considerable clout to convince most of the major studios to refuse to distribute the competing film, Tombstone, while affecting casting on the rival project. Which sounds super spiteful to me. Yeah. Um, and if he was trying to affect casting, he didn't do a good job because the Tombstone cast is insane. Like, it's yeah. deep with very talented people. And the Wyatt Earp one's pretty good, too. Like, just reading through it, Costner, Quaid, Gene Hackman is in it, Jim Caviezel is in it. Uh, Jeff Faye's in it, Catherine O'Hara, Bill Pullman, uh, Adam Baldwin, Tom Sizemore, Joe Beth Williams. Like those are those are names. Those are big yeah. names too. So they both had pretty deep ensembles, but it's not like he did like a very good job of driving people away from Tombstone. <laughs> so That's it's just funny. kind of interesting. Like I don't. I feel like uh, White House Down and Olympus Has Fallen didn't have this kind of rivalry. <laughs> yeah, like I don't know if Dante's Peak and Volcano did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but also nobody cares about. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and nobody cares about Wyatt Earp either. So, <laughs> John Carpenter almost directed this. That would have been something. Uh, I think it would have been interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's it'd have been total, so it's different hard to change. It's yeah, it's hard to change like fundamental talent and yeah. see what it looks like. That's kind of why the uh, the this movie with Wyatt Earp is would be interesting to watch Wyatt Earp to see how different it is. Because you are changing fundamental talent, but you are like he was cast and it's the same characters and everything. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, and Lawrence I, Kasdan directed the Wyatt Earp movie. So, huh, yeah, um, I did. Uh, I did read that when Roger and uh, Roger Ebert, uh, Siskel and Ebert, when they when they were first uh, were going to review this, they couldn't get a screener into it or whatever, like a pass to see it early. So they they just missed it. They didn't review it on its initial release, hmm. and it was re- released during a very busy movie season. Um, you know the holidays yeah. of ninety three or whatever. Christmas, yeah. So yeah. Uh, they didn't get to catch it throughout all the holidays, and then when they saw it, I think, I think Ebert gave it a thumbs up, and Siskel gave it a thumbs down. Um, and, and this is Tombstone, right? Tombstone. And then when uh, I want to say Ebert was just basically like. The movie's not great, but Val Kilmer and Kurt Russell do like a really good job with their performances, and that's enough to keep me interested. Um, which accurate, yeah, I feel to a point. I didn't get to see Siskel's uh, thoughts on it, but no, I mean, I just thought it was kind of interesting that they were like, it's they thought it was kind of wrong <laughs> that like a lot of people <laughs> not slept on the movie, but you know, like didn't get to see it because the holiday season and the promotion wasn't that great for it apparently, but it still made money. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. It I was just kind of interesting uh, to, to read about how I think they felt it should have got a better shot. Cause I don't think it, yeah. I think maybe it also didn't get like many mentions and any awards, but I don't remember if it won anything. Um, but it was just kind of it won any Oscars. or Yeah. Anything. It was just kind of like there and then quickly forgotten. And I, I want to yeah. say Ebert was just kind of like for their performances, the movie should have got more recognition than it did. You know, it's not a perfect movie, but there are some good spots in it. And it was just kind of overlooked as a whole. So I wonder if Kevin yeah. Costner's uh, campaign succeeded any then. Yeah. I Maybe mean, not if for they couldn't get film. a screener, then yeah. Yeah, they couldn't get a screener, then something worked. But uh, it's kind of interesting to, I mean, that happens all the time. Movies kind of fall, slip through the cracks and stuff. Uh, but this one has, for the most part, withstood the test of time in that it is still relevant. People still talk about oh, yeah. Doc Holliday and Val Kilmer and Kurt Russell and everything. I mean, here we are. It was, it's relevant enough that we picked it. So yeah. that's something. 
Yeah. Um, but no, it didn't get really any awards buzz. Uh, I'm looking at some of the other movies that came out that year. Schindler's List won the Best Picture um, for the 93 releases. Jurassic Park came out that year. Um, so, I mean, there's big stuff that it was competing against. But, um, you yeah, know, I mean, that just happens. That movie slipped through the cracks. Oh, yeah. All the time. What else could we have watched? Well, we could have watched the 2016 Ghostbusters. Yeah, I, I don't have much interest in doing that. Um not for any reason, really, but it just didn't look that funny to me. Yeah, I mean, I'm neutral on this one. I'll, if if my wife ever just presses play on it, I'll watch it, but I think she's neutral, yeah. too. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm not at the point where, like, if someone puts it on, I leave the room. But, like, yeah. if we're trying to decide movies and someone's like, 2016 Ghostbusters, I'm like, what else? Yeah. <laughs> and if they said Neighbors, you'd probably go with that. Maybe. Uh, I tried to watch Neighbors 2, and I found it so unfunny uh, in the first 10 minutes, I just turned it off. But I remember thinking the first one was okay. I, mean, I thought the wild. first one was going to be terrible, so when I watched it and it turned out to be pretty funny, I was like, this is better than I thought. There's just, you know, there's good jokes, it's funny, it's a simple plot, but it's totally predictable, but the yeah. humor works still at the same time. Yeah, and it's nice to see, uh, like, I feel like Zac Efron doesn't let loose that often. Yeah. And this was one where he did. And I mean, he tried again with Baywatch, which got considerably worse reviews. Yeah. Um, but it's nice to see Charlie St. Cloud, you know, really grow up into Chuck St. Cloud. Yeah, he uh, he gets to play an antagonist in Neighbors. Um, yeah, that was cool, too. Yeah, he yeah. was really the antagonist. So that that's um, fun. You know, Dave Franco was funny in it, too. Oh, yeah, yeah. The cast works for that movie. but Their, uh, uh, their De Niro party had me, like, just busting out laughing the whole yeah, time. So, yeah, with them sure. all doing the stupid face, so... Yeah, I remember not liking um, Rose. Is it Bryn or Burn? Burn, Rose Burn. Ro- I, I did not think comedy. I don't think comedy suits Rose Burn that well. I don't but. really remember the comedic bits she did, but I was fine with her. I don't know. Um, yeah. I was actually surprised at offended, how but. her and Rogan felt like a couple in the movie. Sometimes, you know, you do the. Yeah, uh, they, they do like some of the real things. Yeah. You know? they, sometimes when you put like the goofy dude and the hot actress together, it just doesn't work. But. They actually yeah. kind of felt like an actual couple there. For so, sure. Yeah. Um, that, did, that did work. Uh, you, we also could have watched Fantastic Beast and Where to Find Them. Yeah, I wouldn't mind I wouldn't mind watching this again because I did fall asleep in the theaters when we went and saw it. Um, but that is a little bit of my commentary on the movie. I thought the pacing was very iffy, and I thought that there were some dry spells in the movie, uh, particularly with the world building. They're trying to set up like this new... I mean, it's Wizarding World still, but it's a new yeah. country. It's a new time period. And there were points where I just clearly did not care enough to keep my eyes open. I liked the ending a lot. I, well, <laughs> I liked the last act a lot. I didn't like when gross Johnny Depp shows yeah. up. Yeah. Like watching Colin Farrell on that movie, I was like, yeah, like, let's do that. And then they're like, no, it's Johnny Depp. And I'm like, this fucking yeah. sucks. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, I was satisfied with the movie. Um, I yeah. liked it. I want to revisit it as well. I did not fall asleep, yeah. but I really enjoyed uh the American sister characters and the Baker. I thought they really made the yeah. film for me. Um, I will agree completely that a gross Johnny Depp took me out of it. But yeah. I mean, if that's the case then you're going to have a hard time watching the next film, which is black mass. Yeah. And uh, is black mass directed by, um, uh, it's not directed by Michael Mann. Is it Michael Mann did a movie like that with Johnny Depp public enemies? I think mm-hmm. Michael Mann did. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Black Mass is Scott Cooper, and I think the reason I'd watch is because I like Joel Edgerton, um, but it very much is a Johnny Depp vehicle. I mean, I remember he's playing he's playing Whitey Bulger, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, and he's got the weird look and the weird voice and everything, so I probably wouldn't want to watch it. You're right. Uh, there also uh, is Where the Wild Things Are. Yeah, I love this movie. Uh, Spike Jones directed it. Spike Jones uh, is a really good director, but I feel like he's so picky with his projects and he spends a lot of time on weird shit. Yeah, um, I agree. I'm, I'm ready. I think we're we as a as a world are ready for Spike Jones to direct again. I mean, her was his last movie, right? Yeah. And her is what 2013, maybe 2014. He, I mean, he probably has something that he's working on. We just don't know it yet. We might yeah, know it. He we seems just like forgot. The kind of guy who. Well, he seems like I, I looked it up recently and there's nothing on his IMDb like announced or in development or anything. He seems like the kind of thing where like he'd be like, I've got a movie coming out in two months and here's the trailer. 
but um Boy of the Wild Things that was very good. Uh, I actually haven't seen it, right? but I like the uh I like the soundtrack. I've heard that. Yeah, it was Arcade with Karen Fire. O um and Arcade Fire, a lot of good people on it. Um no, it's good. Um but I haven't seen the movie, I mean, but it's just I love the source material and I meant to get around to it. I love Spike Jones yeah. and I just yeah. didn't see it for some reason and it's never streaming anywhere, so Yeah. It's just hard to find. I could buy it, yeah. I guess. But uh, I'll let you borrow it. I think I have it. Yeah. Um, we also could have watched The Italian Job. God, I'm glad we didn't. I, this is one of those movies where in high school people were like, oh, yeah, The Italian Job is so cool. But I bet you that guy also that loves cool. Gone in 60 Seconds. I bet it, <laughs> he might. Uh, that's the kind of guy who thinks like um, The Boondock Saints is like the best movie of all yeah. time, too. Well, uh, uh, if kind of Italian guy. Job and Boondock Saints blew his mind, I wonder how he felt about V for Vendetta. Yeah, I feel like that's a little bit of a different crowd. V for Vendetta was one of those movies that, like, you know, your indie people, like, really jumped on. I only saw it for the first time last year, and it was fine, but I yeah. wasn't wowed. Um, I loved the comic, and I was okay with the movie. Um, Is it a good adaptation of the comic? Like, Certain parts faithful? are. The ending's pretty different, and it's not like how Watchmen was different. It's it's a more upbeat ending. Um, mm. You remember the ending of, of the movie, right? Where everyone gets the masks and go marching. Yeah. Like yeah. that's how the movie ends. But in, in the comic, uh, the original V just ends up dying. And then the female character takes over that role. And it just ends with her walking away, like becoming V herself. And, okay. and like, that's it. So the movie's like, we're all V. Yeah, it does a whole Spartacus thing. Um, But the part to me that was most important in the comic is both kind of the creepy stuff with the backstory of V and kind of the concentration camp aspects of it, as well yeah. as the actress who um she gets the toilet paper messages from. That's like what V got when he was yeah, yeah. Uh, when he was imprisoned. That whole sequence with, uh, you know, I don't know who you are, but I love you. Like that woman saying that through her messages. Like, yeah. That is one of the best written things I've ever read in the comics. And then in the movie, they did a really good job capturing it. So I, I was pretty pleased with the overall picture. So Yeah. Cool. Uh, there's also Remember the Titans. Yeah, I mean, we didn't have to talk about this one because all of our listeners probably watched it in high school. Yeah, yeah, the sub days. Month, and... but, yeah, but uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those movies that, like, it's so uplifting that it's almost like, saccharin like it's almost too sweet yeah but um it's just i mean it's good this is like why denzel's the most popular actor in the world yeah or at yeah. least at one point was i don't know who that would be now but i mean it's it's fine i got no beef with remember the titans i just unless i go back to high school for some reason i probably won't ever see it again next up on our list we had artificial intelligence ai yeah, have you seen this? I haven't seen this. Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it at least twice, once when it first came out, and then shortly thereafter, a couple years later. It's fine. Um, It's a weird movie because this is like the last thing I think Kubrick was working on before he passed. Yeah, then, it was like a Kubrick property that Spiel, Spielberg picked up, right? Yeah, and Spielberg, I don't remember if Kubrick started directing it or was like just getting it ready to, and Spielberg like took it from there. Um. But a lot of it definitely feels Kubrick influenced, and then the ending feels very Spielberg. Um, it's fine. Yeah. I've thought about it from time to time because there's a lot of cool visuals in it, but it's not like, you know, the best movie ever made or anything. There, there's cool, cool things. There's some fun, fun stuff in there. And this is Haley Joel Osment, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, Jude Law, and probably a lot more people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those two are definitely like two of the bigger stars in there. I want to say Jude Law plays a character named Gigolo Joe, and he's he's fun to watch in this movie. Yeah. So, um, it, it's you should play a character in everything. Yeah, um, it's a uh, it's a decent watch. I'd say if you haven't seen it, it's worth it. It's long. That's my biggest complaint with it. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I think that's why I haven't seen it because I don't really take a flyer on a two and a half plus hour movie. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. and then, uh, we had two other movies we could have watched. I, after watching Tombstone, wish I would have pushed harder for one of these two because I love them both. Um, first up we have the lost boys. Yeah, this, uh, I've never seen it, but, um, my most experience with it is your wife, Jody went as, uh, not David, but uh, Kiefer Sutherland's character from the lost boys for Halloween last year. Yeah. And she did a good job with it. Um, yeah, there you go. Good faithful adaptation. Yeah. So uh, it, it's a really fun movie. It's 
the Corys. It's, you know, an 80s vampire film. A um, lot of, just a lot of talent in there. And it's just a fun movie to watch. Um, the Lost Boys, obviously, the name ties back to youth and, you know, uh, Peter Pan. But it's also a vampire film. And both of those kind of work really well together. So and it's a prequel to Hook, right? Yeah, I wish. Um, no. Rufio is just in the Lost Boys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, he's like, we can do better. He's played by Garrett Headland in this. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, now the Lost Boys is good. Uh, we'll get Scott to watch it one day. Um, uh-huh. It's uh, there's an amazing sexy man in the, with a saxophone at one point. That's like in the beginning oh, of the yeah, film. I've seen that scene before. Yeah, so that's worth checking out at least. Uh, I say the whole movie is too. But then. Uh, okay. <laughs> our final movie that I'm surprised I didn't push for any harder was uh, Sky High, the Disney family film. It's about superheroes. It stars Kurt Russell, Kelly Preston, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, um, yeah. and Linda Carter, and a bunch of other people. Uh, yeah, Bruce Campbell. Um, like a lot of the sci-fi fantasy cult actors are in it. Uh, some of the kids in the hall are in it, and a lot of up-and-coming uh, talent was in it as well. It's a it's a fun film, man. Um, it the trailer made it look way goofier than it is, and it's probably a lot better than it deserves to be. But honestly, <laughs> it it gets like superhero films better than most superhero films get them. So, I, yeah, I so would I would rank it higher than a lot of the like big ones for myself. No. So. The reason I hadn't seen it is I legitimately thought it was a Disney Channel original, and not that there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but it's just a different level of quality. I mean, I love yeah. some of the Disney Channel original movies, but um. The expectations are different. Yeah. Well, this um, uh, this property they had planned. Adaptation? So what? Is it an adaptation from a comic book or is it original? No, I believe it's a fully original story. Um, they did plan to adapt it into a like comic series and a like TV show afterwards, but it just never really took off. I think it made okay money, but not like money to justify anything like that. Um, so it's a uh, Kurt Russell plays like a Superman esque character with Kelly Preston playing. You know, yeah. like your female superhero, like Wonder Woman type Wonder of character. Woman. Um, they're not they're not analogs for either, but they're just very similar to them. And yeah. uh, the premise here is all the kids go to superhero high school, uh, and you're sorted into hero or sidekick uh, like pathways. And it's completely different. It's basically like nerds and jocks. But uh, the sure. main the main character is the son of these two like superheroes who uh, his. His father is like a second generation superhero, so it's even funnier. Um, but <laughs> when he finally goes to superhero high school, he has no powers. And so the the story kicks off with him getting sorted into sidekick school. And uh, Who so plays the main, the lead there? His name, I actually he's have it. Much he's been in random stuff. It's Michael Angarano. Angarano, he's a, uh, he did a lot of young like when he was young, he did a lot of stuff. He was in um, almost famous as young William in the beginning. Um, oh yeah. yeah, I know who you're talking yeah. about. Then so, uh, and he's gone on to do movies. I mean, he's still in stuff, but it's just like I'm trying to see what the most recent big thing he did was. He was in Red State. I think that's a Kevin Smith movie. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, he just it looks like he he did a bunch of TV as well. He's been in some Drunk History. Um, some episodes of Twenty Four and ER stuff like that. So you yeah. know he he never really took off as a star, but he had a lot of roles as a kid. Um, uh, no, Sky High is good. I I do definitely recommend it. It's it's a fun film. Well, that, that was a pretty good line. A lot of uh, interesting movies, I think. Yeah, yeah, we uh we're in that zone, man. I I like talking movies. I love. That each week we get to at least mention a f- couple of these brief films here, you know, like, uh, like just give them some shout outs. So. Yeah. And this is one of those weeks where I think like our hindsight is 2020 where we neither of us loved or maybe even liked Tombstone that much. Um, so some of those other ones sound pretty appealing. Yeah, that's true. Um, Max, where can the good people find us? Uh, you can always find us at the OK Corral. Uh, shooting a bunch of uh, red bandana outlaws. Or you can just find us at uh, thecriticalbreakdown.com. We're also on Twitter at BreakdownCast, and we're on Facebook. Just look up The Critical Breakdown. Um, yep. Yep. We're on Instagram as well, if you're an Instagrammer. 
yeah. You I can find they call them if you're a Grammy. If yeah. you're an Instagrammy. If you're an Instagrammy. Uh, you can always find me putting on uh improv productions of Faust. Or you can just find me over at Twitter at Max Rivera Film. Uh, you can find me pretending I'm dying of tuberculosis to swindle the sheriff's deputy badge away from Wyatt Earp. Or you can find me at breakdown underscore Scott on Instagram. Uh, make sure to leave us a rating and a review uh, if you like this episode. And uh, shoot us an email at the critical breakdown podcast at gmail.com if, uh, if you think we just, we just missed Tombstone. We just didn't. We didn't get it. Yeah, if we didn't, you know? if you think we didn't get it, just tell us what we missed. Exactly. Yeah. Shoot us your feedback. Yeah, and also let us know if Tombstone is your favorite brand of frozen pizza. Um, I'd be interested to see if that's true for anyone because I always consider it like a, a second tier frozen pizza. Damn. Well, they. they I mean, you got to think at one point the frozen pizza game, you know, it changed. Back in the day, they were they were like the king though. Yeah, but now I feel like they've slid into that like. Uh, like like California Pizza Kitchen's making frozen pizzas. Like there's a gourmet frozen yeah. pizzas. You know? It's not delivery. Tombstone it's is DiGiorno. still your. That's that's right. Tombstone's still your just you know your 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 crust and sauce and cheesy you yeah. know and that's all you need. It's your blue collar um, pizza. That's right. It's a it's the people's pizza. <laughs> um, uh, Josh Rivera did our art. Jason Brown did our music. And Wally is our Huckleberry. Nailed it. Next week on The Critical Breakdown. We're going to test our faith and watch Signs rated 74% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's a miracle.